Well, God's love, and I, I want to make this personal too, God's love for you is everlasting. So what the Bible says, it might not be what um, some people have said, but the Bible definitely says it. Get the right message here. And uh, it's everlasting. Turn in your Bibles to um, 1 John 4. And as always, we'll, we'll build a case. We'll build a case in the Word. Let the Word of God be final authority. You know, I have a testimony. And my testimony is, I was weak, but now I am strong. What made me strong? It was the love of God. Doesn't it stand to reason that someone who, who is loved unconditionally would be stronger than someone who, who's never shown any love? I was weak, but now I'm strong because I found God's love. The, the most important thing we can do as believers is to find the love of God, to understand it, and to, to just embrace it. You know, sometimes people, they, they're, as pastors, we, 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 are, we are in charge of, of, of growing the flock, and we love every minute of it, and we get all kinds, just like you do out in the world. And uh, some people, they're just really sheepish about the things of God, and, 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 and they'll come and they'll come, but, but they got one foot in the world, and, and, and eventually if they keep coming and keep pushing into God, they're going to they're gonna, um, fall in love with the one who loved them first. And, 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 uh, um, but it's a real challenge to keep loving them and keep encouraging them. And then you got other people, they say, I'm going to operate in every single gift there is. I got all the gifts. I'm going to do all these things. It's like, oh. Calm down, tiger. <laughs> you know, and, uh, um, you know, my advice is, is just work on, on knowing God. Don't seek the gifts so much. That's, that's okay to some extent, but it, seek the gift giver. Amen. Spend time in his presence. Spend time in his word. This message was straight from, from the spirit of the Lord right into my heart to you. I'm a vessel of God tonight. You have two choices when you sit in here. This is, this is um, me just telling you what I came up with on my own. Or this is given by the Spirit of the Lord. And if it's given by the Spirit of the Lord, then it's something that, that, that you need to hear, something that will benefit you. And this message is, is God's love for you is everlasting. I had the title, God's love is, ever, is everlasting. And, and I felt like the Holy Spirit said, no, make it personal to them. So God's love for you is everlasting. You need to say that every morning if you struggle with that. Because the world sometimes doesn't, a lot of times the world doesn't show the proper kind of love. The world's all over the place. And many people, including Christians, confuse the love of God with the love of a person or the love of a human being or how they were treated. Can't do that. God's love is way higher. God's love is perfect. Human love is all over the place. And uh, if you're on the, the wrong side of, of someone's um, love uh, or someone or not loving, it can be very hurtful. It can hurt. And so, but God's love is greater. But look at 1 John 4, verse 7. This is a, uh, um, uh, this is New King James. This is a good description of God's love. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, that he loved us and sent his son to be propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And so this verse is weaving in and out of, of God loves us, and then because he loves us, we can love one another. 
But we're never to forget that l true love is God loving us. And we can operate in the same love that, 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 that he has shown for us. The Bible's very clear on that. It says in Romans that the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. We have a tremendous ability to, to love like God loves. But you're not going to love like God loves until you know how much you're loved. You got to be able to nestle down in the, the, the love nest. And you come to, to uh, um, overwhelming, completely uh, undeniable reassurance that, that God's love for you will never fade. It's unconditional. No matter what you do, you can't base... God's love for you is not based on what you do or don't do. He, it's his nature. That's who he is. He's love. And so when you have that kind of base, then you can, you can do what the Bible says, which is draw nigh to God. You know why a lot of people don't draw nigh to God? They're living in, in self-condemnation. They haven't even learned how to love themselves or forgive themselves. And their mind just rehearses everything that they've done wrong. I don't know why, because God doesn't remember it, so why are you torturing yourself like that? I know why. A lot of times, religion. Religion teaches people, false religion, teaches people that God's love is conditioned. They say it's conditioned on, on um, if you go to church, if, if you um, do this right or do that right, then, then God will love you and answer your prayers. Well, that's a lie. God loves you anyway. God has this unique ability to meet every single human being right where they're at. Amen. If you say, God, I'm afraid, you know what he says? It's okay, I got you. If you say, God, I have things in my life that I still struggle with that are worldly, you know what he says? That's okay, I got you. If you, if you say, God, I, I, I'm confused and I don't know which way to go, you know what he says? That's okay. I got you. We are never to run from God. We are to run to the throne of grace. And, and 1 John 4, 7 through 11 is, is a um, beautiful description. What I'm going to show you tonight isn't my, just my theory. It, it's, it's what God's Word says. Religion, religious spirits... Rules and regulations, right? What's that? Rules without relationship. What's that equal? Rebellion. That's religion. Just, just people just going through the motions and things like that. Puts a tight grip on people. Jesus said they put a yoke on them. They, they put a heavy burden on them that they themselves can't even, can't even do. Well, thankfully for you, you're not in a religious establishment here. You're not part of a, a we're not religious. I don't like that word. We're Christians. We're the church. We're the body of Christ. Religion plays, acts, plays the part of a church. We are the church. And, and we're proud of it. So let me say this again. God's love for you is unconditional. He doesn't love you because of some virtue you possess. God loves you because God loves you because God is love. I like to put it this way. God doesn't just, sometimes people say, well, God, it's not good enough to say God has love. I don't like when people say God has love because how do I know he has love for me? You know what I mean? We have to say it correctly. God is love. If you go to God, you go to love. You're not just going to a God that has a propensity or an ability to love. Because most people are going to think, well, he loves everybody but me because I know what I did last night. Or I know what I'm currently doing. I know what I did before. I know my failures. So you have to understand, let people know that God is love. That's his nature. And he doesn't change. If God just has love, how would I know, if, like I said, if God has love for me? How will I know? Many people, many people have sought love from people who had love for others, but not for them. Many people, they're on the short end of the stick. When it comes to love, if they're drawing straws, 
Their whole life, they got the short end. And they feel like, I never could measure up. I could never measure up to this person or that person. I could never be good enough. Guess what? With God, you measure up. The morning, the, the minute he formed you in your mother's womb, you already measured up. Amen? You got you to personalize this message. God's love for you is everlasting. I know people can, people throw human beings away like they're garbage. Or, or that's, that's human beings. We're talking about God. And we as human beings, we have the capacity to love like God too. As I said, we can, we can love the unlovable. You know why? Because Some of us feel like we might have been unlovable at one time. You know, I remember a long time ago, um, our family, uh, um, talking about when I lived with mom and dad, our ho- that household, there was an old beat up kitten, kitty cat on the road. That thing was ugly as ugly could be. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying, I'm I'm just being truthful. Anybody remember that cat? I'm talking about Goober for the family. (laughs) We named him Goober. But anyway, that cat was so ugly. It looked like it had some, like 10 diseases. And the guy that was at the house that day, he said, kill that thing. We brought it in, took care of it. And we loved that cat. Goober was a good cat. (laughs) We loved him, took care of him. He provided us years of entertainment. Anytime we had company over, Goober would hide out in the shadows to the right time and he would pounce on them. That was fun. <laughs> Sometimes you could watch, you know, how they wiggle, you know, watch that, that. We could say, here he comes. People we thought a lot of, we would warn them about Goober. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but there you go. Um, that's the way the world is. Maybe some of us felt that way. Maybe some of us were, were like Goober. Nobody saw anything in us. Nobody saw any redeemable value. But you know what? God always sees the best of you. You know why? You don't, you don't have to try to prove your heart to him. He already knows your heart. Amen? When, when you make a mistake, he knows. First of all, he, he's, he's, he's already made provisions for all that stuff. His name is Jesus Christ. If you're a born-again believer, he doesn't even deal with you. He doesn't even deal with the world like that. He deals with you with love and kindness and mercy. But the minute your heart is sorry, God already knew you were sorry. He already knew. He's always on the spot for us, isn't he? And so, you know, if I, if I say that, you know, God has love, well, how do I know his love for me um, won't change because of, of something I've done? Many people, this is why I say many people, because we got to be able to tell the world and understand for ourselves, because this is the world. It's a tough world out there. Many people have, have been hurt by someone who, quote, they fell out of love with them. They treated them right, they treated them good, and they did all these things, and then, and then they, they dropped them. Or they say dropped them like a bad habit or whatever, you know? And, and, uh, but God will never fall out of love with you. He'll never get tired of you. He'll never say, boy, you failed 15 times and now you're asking me for another chance. In fact, the minute you wake up in the morning, God's eyes are watching over you, wanting to give you a good day, wanting and hoping that you will reach out to him, the one who loves you like no one else. I'll even go deeper into this love walk because when you talk about God's love, it's eternal. It's deep. We can only get so far right now. But one day you'll be staring Jesus eye to eye and you're going to see love like you've never seen it before. But until that day, we just keep growing in that love and we keep trying to understand it. We keep receiving it and accepting it by the word and by the spirit. And, and, And but one day the veil of the flesh will be gone and the Bible says you, you, will be know, you will know him as you are known. 
Wow, what a wonderful day that'll be, to be in the presence of pure love, because that's who he is. God, do you know that God loves the people who are spending eternity in hell? He loves them too. Look at John 3.16. We know there's a lot of people in there at that terrible place. Not by God's will. No one's in there because a lack of love from God. John 3.16. This is one of the most well-known verses that there is, but it should be. For God so loved the world. Let me just stop it there. Who did he, he love? Does it say God loves the Christians? Does it say God loves the Americans? The Chinese? The Japanese? The world. What's he mean by the world? He, certainly he means the people of the world, right? For God so loved the world. Can you think of the world, even our today's world, that does, that does not love him back? Right? For God so loved the world that he did what love does. He gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's will. God did not stop loving those people who are in hell just because they, they rejected him. His nature never changes. He is Love, right? God's nature is not based on what we do. It's based on who God is. The Bible's very clear on that. If, if you just are, have an open heart. But I, I tell you, sometimes people coming off the street that don't have a lot of experience with the church, they'll, they'll get it real quick. But sometimes people that have been taught for years and years and years about uh, the wrong way, boy, it's hard. They can do it. There's people in here that have done it. But it takes a lot of love, a lot of nurturing, a lot of, it takes repetition. In other words, they need to keep coming and keep hearing the word and let God transform them from the inside out. But if you're taught wrong for years and years and years, if you miss it on the love part, God's unconditional love, you're not going to have any peace. You're not going to have any, um, any kind of uh, joy. What a terrible thing it would be to live a life to think that, does God love me anymore because I, I've behaved a certain way? What a terrible way to live. I don't know that way. Because I've been taught my whole life in here by our founding pastor that God loves me always. That's, the, that's one of the fundamental teachings of this church is that God loves me always. So what did I do knowing that? At the worst times of my life, what did I do? I did not run from God. Why would I run from a God who loves me always? I ran to God every single time. I ran to God him, not from him. Why did I run to him? I was taught and it was drilled in me and the Holy Spirit is in me that God loves me always. And nothing I do will ever, ever change that. Ever. And it is a sad, sobering thought to think that those people that are in hell, God never wanted any of them to go there. The Bible says God doesn't want anyone to perish. He gave everything he could give. He gave Jesus. But yet man is gifted with free will. That's why Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. They crucified Jesus for that message. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, that's how, that's how he got put on the cross. Because he, he put himself up there with God, because he is God. I'll never forget one day, Leslie and I, uh, I said this before, um, we went to, uh, to uh, speak to a, uh, um, in the same, I think it was in the same day, pretty much, or if it wasn't the same day, it was, it was uh, right after, a day after the other, but um, people that um, 
uh, the one, the, both of them were in their last days, put it that way. The one guy was a, he was a younger guy. He wasn't real young, but he wasn't old either. But, um, but he had a good, good background in, in God's love. He was taught right. Now, he didn't always live the life that he was capable of living. But that did not change God's love. And it certainly did not strip him of his salvation. And I went to talk to him in the hospital. And, and he looked me in the eye and he said, I know I'm going to heaven. And I just thought about this tonight because I'll never forget that look in his face. He said, I know where I'm going. You know why he could be so sure? Because he knew God loved him. He knew God loved him unconditionally. Religion says if you, don't, if you don't act the part or do the part, if you don't do this, hey, you lose everything. Not, not in the Bible you don't. Maybe in their warped thinking. But the Bible says that nothing will separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The Bible says when you come to Jesus, you are born again. You are a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. God seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise. He seals your spirit. Now you got your soul to, that must be impacted with the Word of God. The way you think and your will and your emotions and, and the flesh and your body, that part can go awry. That's why you got to stay on top of things and keep pounding that Word in there and keep getting that Word for for. for what it's worth for the most important thing, get filled with the Spirit and pray in tongues. That's a whole nother level, right? That's a whole nother level. But, you know, we went to, uh, we went to see um, an older lady. She was well, well up in years. And uh, I told Leslie, I think I remember telling Leslie, this one's going to be easy. We're going to sit there with this precious lady because she was very precious. Very precious. Good, good soul. I don't think she, she ever hurt a person in her life or ever even thought about it. And I said, this is going to be easy. We're going to sit there and we're going to have a good evening and just give, comfort her and talk about the love of God and, and just be there for her. And soon, someday, here soon, she's probably just going to go step on over. It's all good. And I, I just started talking to her. Well, man, I, I said, one day, you know, when, when, when it's your time, you're going to step right into heaven. And she said, I hope so. And I'm like, what? There goes my nice relaxing evening of just. <laughs> now it was on. Now Preacher John had to come out. <laughs> and, and I had to minister to someone else's sheep that didn't have the, the blessing of being here all the years like I had. But they're all Jesus' sheep. And we worked on her and worked on her for a long time. And I know she's with the Lord. But it just shocked me that the contrast... Why did she say, I hope so? I'll tell you exactly why. She didn't know that God loved her unconditionally. Somewhere in that precious soul's life, that probably never even hurt an ant. I mean, she was so precious. If she saw a little ant on her kitchen, on her kitchen counter, she probably got a little jar and put it in the jar and took it outside in the woods. I mean, this, she's like the most precious soul. She did not know or have a complete understanding of God's love. Yes, yeah, prayed for everybody all the time. You know, she had a precious soul. You need to know, and I know you do, but I want to reinforce it. Maybe some of you come in here tonight, you didn't know about that kind of love. Look at Malachi 3, 6. I'll just give you another scripture. What we do as pastors, we build a case with the word. That's all. You say, well, someone, no one ever said that in here, but someone might say, well, why do you use so many scriptures? What do you want me to do? 
give you my own opinion, my own thought, or you want me to tell you what the Word says and work off the Word? No one in here would say that because you're all Word lovers. I remember when uh, um, we had the Bible school here, and uh, um, one of the students was saying, I don't know why, I, I, I just can't wait to get to school. I love the school. I, lo I love just being there. They love church too. They love it all. And I said, I'll tell you why. Because you're a word lover. You love the word. You know, like meat lover's pizza? <laughs> She's a word lover. She was a word lover, still is. If you love the word, you can't get enough of it. If you love the word, you'll even turn off hee haw for a while and just get the word. I try to pick on hee haw because I don't think anybody else watches it. Not else, I don't watch it. I hope nobody watches it. Right? You know, th there's old shows. Speaking of hee haw, that's somebody's, some people's in the world, in the church, that's their theme song. Not this church. Gloom, despair, and, and misery on me. What was that song those guys sang? If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Doom, despair, and agony on me. That's it. <laughs> Look at Malachi 3 6. This is God talking to Israelites, of the Israelites. He says, For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. You know what he's saying? I love you. I'm going to do the best I can for you, even though you are rebellious, even though you are ungrateful. And they were. God said, I don't change. I am love. And my love is an unchanging love. That's my nature. That's my character. God's love for you is without end. It's eternal. It's limitless. It has no bounds. You want to compare God's love to something big on the earth? How about the Atlantic Ocean? It's big. All the thousands, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of life in the ocean it's deep, it's wide, it just takes up a lot of uh, ground. But I tell you one thing, you can stand on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, can you not? Can you stand on the shores? Can you find the beach and stand there and say, well, I'm outside of it. There's the ocean. Yeah, it's big, and you could never swim across it, and it's bigger than what you, but, you know, it's humongous. But it still has boundaries. You cannot stand on the shores of God's love. You're, the only thing you can do with God's love is swim in its depth. That's the only thing you can do is swim in the depth of God's love. Because the reason you're here in this life is God's love. The reason you can breathe is God's love. The reason that, you're, that you can think is God's love. Your existence is in God's love. You can surrender to a love like that. I did. I surrendered to a love like that. No human being can escape from God's love, even when they reject Him. I just want to drill this home. So if you, if you go home, you'll say, boy, God really does love me. He really does. You can get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, I don't look real good today. It's a bad hair day. But that's okay. God loves me. Right? None of you would have a bad hair day. See, I don't have to worry about bad hair days, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> right? I heard a story about a man one day, he, he went out in the middle of a football field. He had, a, he had a lot of people, this is a true story, a lot of people there. He was going to make a big point about God is not real. And he said, I'm going to go in the middle of the football field and I'm going to curse God for one hour solid. I'm going to curse him and curse him. And he did. He went out there and said the most terrible things about God. But he said this, if God strikes me down, then he's God. If he doesn't, there is no God. He went out there and made that kind of a, uh, of a, of a show. 
And after an hour, he stopped, and he's like, see, there's no God. And so he's walking off the field, and there was, there was this, this, this older guy there, a wise older guy that heard about it. He was just waiting for him to come off the field. See, the older guy knew this guy was going to come back off the field. He wasn't going to get struck down with lightning. Not from our God. And you know what he said to the guy? He said, son, don't you know you can't exhaust God's love for you in one hour? That's the shallow mentality of the world. Ah, for one hour, I can curse God, and he won't love me. Or he, there's no God. No, no, no. Just the fact that you were born ought to show you that God loves you. Just the fact that you can know that there's a cross ought to tell you that God loves you. Aren't you glad we have a God like that? Look at Ephesians chapter 3. This is a prayer by the Apostle Paul. He's praying for the church at Ephesus to know the love of God. He wants them to know it. Sometimes people get saved and they're saved for like a year. And they're like, I know everything. No, nah, you're still a baby. I'll say what this one sportscaster says I like. Breath smelling like Similac. <laughs> <laughs> You're still a baby. <laughs> the, you got a lot of learning to do. I've been at this a long time, and, and, and I got a lot of learning to do. You think you can come to the end of knowing God? <laughs> come on. You want to know how you can truly, truly know the love of God? Walk in his love. Walk in that love. Ephesians 3, Paul's praying that they would know the, the love of God. If it was important to him. Look at verse 14. He says, for this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. Verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul's saying, I want you to know the width, the length, the depth, and the height. I want you to be rooted and grounded in this love. He's, he's telling them, you don't know the love like, like you, you can know it. And I want you to... to to press in to God so you can know how very, very much he loves you. The Amplified Bible says that you, that you would fully experience the amazing, endless love. That was a prayer, was it not? We can go to another scripture. Look at Romans 8. Romans 8, verse 35. People say, like I said, we're always students of the Word. We're always fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. You seek God, you find Him. You search the Word as if for a treasure, and you'll, and you'll if you search it for it as it is, the treasure that it is, you'll get the treasure of the Word back. I remember when I worked for the tree service, I think I was in, in, the, in the service maybe like three, three and a half years or so. And I remember talking to dad one day, he came out on the job and he said, it takes a good seven years for a man to be a good tree man. And I'm thinking, yeah, I got this. I didn't believe him. And then when I got seven years under my belt, I, I thought, I didn't know anything three years back <laughs> or three and a half years back. You know, we need people older and wiser 
that love is enough to tell the truth. And we can't, if you're not growing in your understanding of God's love and growing in your knowledge of the Scripture and, and growing in your love for others, you're going backwards. No one stays at the same spot. Remember the, the analogy that we use? It's like rowing up a river. The world is, is flowing with the currents of selflessness, selfishness, of self-righteousness. We are rowing up the Scripture, up the river with the Scriptures and the love and the, and, and the serving of God. If you stop rowing and take a nap, where are you going to be an hour after you wake up? You're not going to be where you were. You're going to be down there somewhere. That's why God said this. The, Paul said this. Put your hands on the plow and don't you dare look back. Paul said, I have run my race, and, and I fought the good fight, and I've run the race. He compared his life for living for God as being in a, in, a, in a fight and running a race. Two very, very challenging things, is it not? So if you're living your life and you think, well, I ain't got no fight to fight, and I ain't got no race to run, you're not, you're not completely understanding things yet. Look at Romans 8, verse 35. This is New Living uh, Translation on this one. Romans 8, verse 35. He asks the question, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. Verse 37, he answers his question. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Verse 38, I am convinced that nothing, someone say nothing, nothing can ever ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed. Nothing in all creation will ever separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. This doesn't make me want to run out and go sin. I'm just telling you right now. This makes me want to, to serve God with every ounce I have in me. That's what it's meant to do. When you put a burden on people that, that God may or may not love them, he may change their mind, they have to, it's a condition. You know what it does? It breaks people's spirits and they give up. It's like, I, I've, been, I've been this way in the past before, not, not this way back when, but I, when I had, well, raising four children on your own and working full time and got, in, got all these things to do, sometimes I would have so much stuff to do, it would overwhelm me. You know what I would get done? Nothing. <laughs> I would just do Nothing. That's why I got a good wife now, because she really runs the show, and she keeps, and I need that. I need that. She's a good administrator. I don't even get mad anymore when she tells me what to do. I just say, okay. <laughs> I need someone to help me keep her steer, because if I get overwhelmed, it's like, I do nothing. Some people are like that. I got other good traits. What's it? Okay, you're with me. Okay. <laughs> I got other good traits that, that help her. <coughs> when you put these big burdens on people, you know what they do? Nothing. Nothing. But if you show them God, this kind of love, they get up in the morning and say, God, today I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to spend, you, you want to spend time with someone who knows, likes you, and loves you, right? And God, I know you have a plan for my life. I know you have a purpose for my life, and I'm going to go after it. That's what I did one day. I said, God, I'm going after your plan, and I'm not going to stop. I didn't know it was going to lead me up here. I just, I, I went with God. And if he put me here, that's his business. 
I didn't want to be here. I didn't ask to be here. I didn't plan or connive to be here. I just fell in love with God. And he took me on a journey. No wonder he told me to hang on. And I'll tell you one thing, when you go on a journey with God, you're going to reach your destination, but, uh, but God's not going to show you everything off the bat. Because if, if he overwhelms you before you're ready to comprehend and, and, and strong enough to, to, to go for it, then, then you're going to do nothing. So he just gives it to you little by little. But it gets better and better and better. It's like that old um, kid's thing. You can be like Peter Cottontail, hopping down the bunny trail. Hippity hop, all, something like that, I don't know. But just go down the trail. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Did you ever notice where the lamp is? It's on your feet. It's walking, just showing you where, just, just right out ahead of you. It didn't say God's word is a big spotlight that I could see for miles. No, it's a lamp unto my feet, and I got to keep walking and walking in God's love and, and word and by the Spirit of God and keep trusting Him and believing Him that He has a plan for my life and that He'll fulfill it and that I, 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 can, I don't have to sit on the bench. I can be an active player in the kingdom of God. Amen. And He puts the pieces together. I just spit. I almost got evangelistical on you. <laughs> <laughs> he puts the pieces together. <laughs> I, I like it like that. You know why sometimes I'm transparent? Because I don't want anybody to think that I, that I, that I could ever in a million years do what, God, what, what I'm doing. So I want you to know, I was weak. I was so very weak. But now I'm strong. And God did that. Amen? And if he did it for me, he'll do it for you. I'll go on the ride with you. I'll go on this journey with you. But you gotta, you gotta show up. Right? You gotta, you gotta get in and be knit together and, and, and let's, let's, let's become like mind and like, like purpose. And let's just seek to glorify God. When we do that, we can do all things. But look at 1 Corinthians um, 13, 4. This would be New Living Translation too. First Corinthians 13, 4. This is a good description of God's love. And the reason I want to read it because it's very... Remember a couple key things about God's love. God's love is... is um, unconditional. Remember, we're, we're to walk in God's love too, right? I mean, we're to love like God loves. We can do it because God told us to do it, right? God's love is, is not based on feelings all the time. It's a decision. It's a decision to do these things. How many people in this room think that Jesus felt, felt like going to the cross? I'll tell you how he felt because the scriptures tell us he sweated great drops of blood because he was going to be separated from, from God the Father because all the sins of the world were going to be on him and him and the Father have always existed together. But he who knew no sin became sin. He died that death of a sinner so we could live the life of a saint. And he asked the Lord Father three times, if this cup can be removed, let it be removed. But you know what? No one could drink that cup but Jesus. So what did Jesus do? I'll tell you what he did. He walked in love. Love for the Father first. Everything Jesus ever did was love for the Father first. But out of the love for the Father, we are loved. He went to the cross on his own. Did they find him hiding behind a tree, whimpering? Or did he say, here I am. Go ahead and take me. That's what he did. Right? So, but here's some description of love. 
In 1 Corinthians 13, 4, love is patient and kind. Now, I, I want to read this. When I read this, don't take on condemnation. If you're not patient and kind right off the bat, they say, well, that rules me out. <laughs> That's not that I'm out. <laughs> this is to be aspired to. This is something that, that you have an ability to do as a children of God. But how are you going to know to do it unless you know that, that, you're, that you're instructed to do it? You want to know, if you really, really, really want to walk in God's love, read 1 Corinthians 13 three times a day. These scriptures right here. Three times a day. Just read them. You'll get, you'll get your mind renewed. It'll keep filling up in your spirit. And, and, and you'll be transformed from the inside out. You'll go from Mr. or Mrs. Meanie to softy. Right? You'll be so soft and kind, you'll be the one crying at the movie. When you go to the movie with your wife, and your wife will say, you're crying, you'll say, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm talking about myself, never mind. <laughs> it's good to have a soft heart. Why? Your family needs you to have a soft heart. Your church needs you to have a soft heart, and the world definitely needs you to have a soft heart because the world gets given up on all the time. People give up on them, throw them out, like I said, like they're nothing. We can't do that, right? So love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will, come, will become useless, but love will last forever. Love lasts forever. But look at verse 8. In verse 8, Paul, Paul is mentioning the spiritual gifts, is he not? Spiritual, supernatural spiritual things, right? Prophecy, is that supernaturally spiritual, right? Um, speaking in tongues and, and special knowledge or word of wisdom, or, uh, uh, those things. But then he also mentions one other thing in there, the greatest one, love. Do you think he mentions these supernatural spiritual gifts and love is not supernatural and spiritual? It is. It's supernatural love that's in you as a child of God. His word is love. His spirit is love. You are reborn or you are born again. You are new creation. You are a love child. Supernatural. That's why Jesus said, I'll, I'll paraphrase Jesus. He said, look, he said, you're out there loving people. I'm paraphrasing him now. Out there loving people because they are loving you back. Big deal. What do you want? A cookie for that? He didn't say that. I'm paraphrasing. He said the true love is when you love those people that aren't loving you back. Just like Jesus did when he went to the cross. That's the true love. You know what that kind of love does? That love, when shown to others, changes people's hearts. Changes lives, doesn't it? I'm reminded of the story when James and John, the sons of thunder, these guys, they, Jesus named them the sons of thunder, sons of Zebedee. They, they were, walked with Jesus for his whole ministry. Jesus was the teacher. They had the best Bible teacher in the world, Jesus. He taught them about love continually. He taught them about forgiveness. He, patience takes a lot of patience. Because one day, the city of Samaria didn't, didn't want to receive Jesus into their, into their city. And James and John had a bad moment. And they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down out of heaven and burn them all? Literally. Lord, you want, these are disciples. You want us to burn them all? You know Elijah called fire down out of heaven. You want us to burn them all? 
men, women, children, dogs, cats, goldfish. You want us to just take them all out. Everybody. And you know what Jesus did? He said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. I came to save men's lives, not to destroy men's lives. Because you know something about love? God's love? Love creates, love heals, and love preserves. Hate destroys, destroys, and causes mystery, misery. I'm glad we got the love of God, right? Um, look at the last scripture, Mark 12, verse 30. Wasn't it Jesus who taught the disciples to love their enemies? Jesus taught on love a lot, did he not? Look at uh, Mark 12, verse 30. This is the last scripture, and I'm going to close up. I just felt led to put this in here because I just, I just know the Holy Spirit wants me to get it out. This one little last point I want to make. Um, in Mark 12, verse 30. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart. Mark 12, verse 30. Still here some pages. He says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, this is King James. When it says the second, like it, you know what it's saying? When he says the second commandment now, like it, this, the one equally important. One equally, the sa equally important. Is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So Jesus is talking about loving three different persons or three different groups. He says, love God. Love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Everybody else, right? But there's another person in there that he says to love. Love your neighbor as yourself. You got to use the supernatural, powerful love of God that you've been gifted with to love yourself. Why not love yourself? God loves you. Why not forgive yourself? Why not, why not just... just Walk with an assurance that I love myself because I am valuable to God. I am somebody. So you got off to a rough start and maybe things are, I'll tell you what, you love yourself because God loves you. What do people do every time they're trying to help hurting people that are really, really hurt? They try to build them up and build them up and, and get them confidence. You got to have all the confidence in, in the world and start loving yourself. Let the past be where it's supposed to be, in the past. And when you wake up tomorrow, go ahead and say, today is the first day of the rest, day of, uh, rest of my life. Today's the first day of a life of, of loving myself. As I love God, as I love my neighbor, I love myself too. One last thing I just want to say, um, Paul said that the husbands are to love their wives. As Christ loved the church. If that isn't proof that we can walk in the same love of, of Jesus Christ, nothing is. Because what did Jesus do for the church? Gave his life laid his life down for the church on the cross. The Bible says you are supposed to love your wife with that kind of love. I, had a man, I heard a man one day, he said, he said, I was praying to the Lord. He says, how can I love my wife like that? I mean, because, I mean, that's a, that's a powerful love. And, and the Lord said, you're not going to love her with your love. You're going to love her with my love. Amen? And so, change your words, change your heart. Say the loving words. There's a reason why the Lord wants me to put this in here right before I end. So, change your words, change your heart. Say about, say about to your wife what you said in the beginning. Or your husband. Right? 
that love is still in you, it'll come up to the top. It'll surface. That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming out. It's good to see everybody here on a Wednesday night. I know my journey for the Lord, the Lord told me to do two things right off the bat when I called out to him. Single parent, four children. Felt like somebody kicked me in the gut. Just like empty. And uh, I mean, sometimes we can know God and then walk away from, from God because we're human and get caught up in other things. And, and I, but I, I, I sat on my kitchen floor and said, God, I'm in now if you'll have me. And you know what? He was there in 0.5 seconds. I didn't say if you would have me because I knew he would have me. Just knew because that's how I was raised. And, and, and he, he spoke to me that day. Imagine that. I hadn't spoken to God in a long time and I come to him and I need him the most and, 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 and he didn't say, well, it's about time. Or he didn't say, well, you again. No, the God, the creator of the universe actually came into my kitchen and had a conversation with me. I didn't hear him audibly. I heard him in here. And he said, look, I want you to do two things for me. I want you to spend time with me. I want you to read the word and I want you to pray. And I want you to give me the good, here's what he said, the good prime time. Because when you're really busy, it's easy to give the God, God the garbage time at the end of the day. And then you wake up in the middle of the night or in the morning and you think, did I fall asleep on God? Oh, yes, you did. He said, I, he said if you want to go out somewhere on a Saturday and play basketball or something, and, but we have, we have a, 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 if you've already said in your heart that this is your time with me, tell your friends you got an appointment, you can't make it. Give me some of that time. Give me the fresh time. <laughs> So I started doing that, and I opened up the book of Jeremiah, and I saw God like I had never seen him before. Jeremiah is the weeping prophet, and he shows you God's heart. And then God said, I want you to do one other thing for me. He said, I want you to start going to church. I want you to be consistent in going to church. He said, I want you to get there Sundays, and I want you to get there Wednesdays. This is what he told me. He doesn't tell everybody the same thing, but I know he's going to tell everybody to go to church. But I wanted God so bad, I said, God, I'll do you one more thing. I said, I'm going to do Sunday nights too. You want me there, that's where I'm going to be. Because sometimes, it, you know, it's easy. You, get, you know, it's easy not to go. But I, I knew that's where God wanted me to be. It's not that I didn't. Every time I came to church and Dad preached the message and he said, well, that's all I have, I'd be like, no. <laughs> I want some more. <laughs> Anybody knows, everybody knows what I'm talking about. I want some more. It was just like feeding me. But that flesh, it's just like, just acts up. And he wanted a commitment from me. And I said, I'm going. And I went, and I've been going ever since. But what I was searching for was a friend, a companion, someone I could talk to, someone that, that, that I could just, be myself around. It's just someone that, that, that I could just trust in him that he wasn't holding anything against me and he believed in me. And he must, he must really have loved me and believed in me to, to entrust me to be standing up here because you guys are special and this church is special. And there's not one time I stand up, up here that I am not grateful and thankful and just in awe that God would ever ever do that for me. And so what he does for one, he'll do for another. We all don't have the same journeys, individual journeys. You know, you shouldn't seek someone else's journey. You should seek your own. But remember this, just fall in love with, with God. Stop searching for the gifts or the titles. Those things will come. Just seek God and you'll find he is everything his word says he is. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for every person that's here. I thank you, Lord, that often on a Wednesday night, it is a sacrifice to get here, Lord, but they're here. And I thank you, Lord, that they, they were rewarded. And, and I thank you, Lord, that they're encouraged. And, 
and ready, Lord, to, to keep getting into your presence and excited about the future that you not only have for them, but that your future that you have for us as a church. Lord, I thank you for keeping them happy and safe and healthy in all that they do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.